as you can see, uh, we have three uh, speakers with me this, this morning. Um, Mark Lukey, who is uh, CEO of, of Prairie Aquatech, Tyler Lorenzen, who's uh, CEO and co-founder of Purus uh, Proteins, and Baljit Dutra, who's um, uh, co-founder and chief technology officer for Sella Farms. Uh, they each have their own uh, uh, important uh, area where they uh, compete and, and have impact in this landscape, and you're going to hear the the stories uh, directly uh, from them. So I'll, I'll leave the details uh, to them because they'll know it far better better than I. We, we chose them intentionally. Um, there's <clears throat> there's a, a, a growing need for valorization of all sorts of agricultural raw materials that could be uh, high quality protein sources. So we, we have speakers who have focus uh, on technologies that are linked to emerging crops like uh, yellow pea in the case of, uh, of Purus, uh, soy and other materials in the case of uh, Prairie Aquatech. Uh, and in, interestingly for cell farms, you don't really hear much about the role that uh, cereals play uh, in this. And yet if you look broadly uh, from a global standpoint, cereal protein is an incredible opportunity for, for uh, increasing and enhancing the quality. And Baljit's gonna tell you about some very interesting um, te uh, technology that they are developing and trying to commercialize. You'll hear a lot about fermentation. Uh, this is an emerging uh, platform. You may have seen just in the last few days, the executive order coming out of the US uh, White House about the importance of bioprocessing and various biotechnologies. And of course, fermentation is right at the, at the center of a lot of that. You'll also hear a lot about what we see as probably very significant emerging forces in this landscape as a result of uh, sustainable fuels. And you go, what, what does sustainable fuels have to do with alternative proteins? And, and Mark in particular, I think is gonna shed some, uh, some light on that. So, so let's leave it uh, at that. We want to get into uh, the details. Each uh, speaker uh, has uh, 15, 20 minutes to kind of tell their story. We have an extra five for questions that you'd have specific uh, to them. And then when all are done, we'll have an uh, extra 20 minutes or so for uh, a uh, panel discussion. So you can uh, ask questions of them uh, while they're all together. So a very unique opportunity to learn and, and listen to um, the trials and tribulations and successes that these three uh, have created for themselves and others as they have started from scratch uh, and to their current state. So we're really looking forward to it. And we appreciate the three uh, speakers very much uh, joining us uh, here today in support of the Sustainable Protein Forum that will be held the first week of October in Chicago and sponsored, of course, by, by the AOCS. So we're gonna start with, um, with Mark. Uh, as I said, he's co-founder and CEO of, of Prairie Aquatech. And, and a little more than a decade ago, uh, he along with uh, some other collaborators and, um, and a venture uh, a group called Innovation Partners in uh, South Dakota, uh, launched into a mission of, of trying to find interesting technologies uh, that could benefit from expertise to take it from primarily an academic environment into a, 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 an actualized uh, commercial environment. And Mark will tell you the story primarily of, of Prairie Aquatech, but there are some sister companies along the way uh, that were also part of this. And so in the, in the spirit of Mark's uh, skills and experience and talent uh, as a serial entrepreneur, uh, bear, bear that in mind. In fact, before he got involved in, in this particular uh, landscape, uh, uh, Mark was a serial uh, entrepreneur in the communications uh, space. And so he's worked um, uh, in an in, uh, entrepreneurial mindset for quite some time. And each of them have their own unique challenges and, and opportunities, but they all uh, have had a, a common theme around how do you take technology and, and bring it to a point where it's, it's a bringing value and positively impacting um, global, global consumers. 
So uh, Innovation Partners, just to give you a bit of a, a dimension to it, has invested uh, in the neighborhood of a quarter of a billion dollars into a number of these companies. So you can see there's a, been a sizable in, in investment in their creation and operation. Uh, Mark serves as president and, and CEO, uh, or has served as president and CEO of a private equity firm. Uh, again, uh, focused in areas like telecommunications and, and uh, areas like this. But he's, uh, he's been passionate about this for, for more than a decade, and he brings this passion to work, uh, you know, every single day. And, um, and, and so I, I want to give you another sense of, uh, you know, kind of the size and scale. Mark has successfully managed uh, uh, the development of companies, uh, their, their successful exiting post-investment. Uh, um, dozens of dozens of times, so he's uh, got tremendous experience here. So he could be a great uh, uh, resource for members of the audience to kind of pick his brain. Um, Mark's also been named to uh, Prairie Business Magazine's top 40 under 40, um, and he uh, serves on a number of governing boards. Mark is very well connected into the uh, economic development and even the government uh, community within the region where. Uh, Prairie Aquatech operates, and, and those communities uh, value Mark's insight uh, tremendously. Uh, and then, because he really doesn't have enough spare time on his hands, he's also uh, he's competed successfully in a number of Ironman uh, triathlons. So uh, uh, it's with, with that kind of background that, Mark, we want to turn it over to you and, and hear the story of uh, Prairie Aquatech and where you see uh, the alternative uh, protein industry going. No, thank, thanks for that, Phil. Uh, it's, it's really a pleasure uh, to be here with you and to, uh, to be here with a AOCS. Really appreciate AOCS uh, putting this on. Uh, it's an important message. Uh, and I, I thank all the participants out there as well uh, for listening into this. Hopefully there's a few nuggets in here and, and certainly as we go through the, our presentations, um, uh, get our perspective with questions that, that you may have. So uh, with, with that, um, uh, I wanted to just start with Prairie Aquatech's vision. Um, you know, I, I grew up on a small farm here in South Dakota. It was really a pleasure for me to come back and, and help the region commercialize research. And, you know, to be able to put a vision out there, like, like this statement of inspiring the world to use better plant-based ingredients for a better life, that's a, you know, that's a, it's a big vision and uh, very fortunate uh, to be involved in a, in a major project like this. And so just before we kind of get into the story here, I want to let you know what we do. We, we started uh, this, this vision by fermenting soy protein for the large aquaculture feed and pet food markets. And so that's at the end of the day, that's, that's what we're doing. That's the, the product that we, that we turn out. And you can see at the bottom of this slide, our core values, uh, safety, quality, respect, transparency, and innovation. Um, these are not just words to us. These are critical to how we make decisions uh, every single day. So that was a real important uh, part of starting this journey was to make sure we had a framework for the multitude of decisions uh, that entrepreneurs face. Uh, when you have that framework, it becomes much easier to make decisions and make decisions very, very quickly. Um, I, but we didn't, we didn't start here. Uh, this has been an, an evolution, and you're going to see a number of different uh, twists and turns on our journey uh, that, that helped us get to uh, being able to state this, uh, this vision. So these next four slides, I'm going to take you through them very quickly. This was from our original pitch deck. Um, and, I, you know, this is a must-have slide from the 2010s. Uh, where we talked about, you know, what the population is doing and what we're going to need to do as a global society to feed the population. So I, yeah, I've listened to a number of different pitch decks. Um, I've given a number of different pitches. And, and more often than not, uh, this, this is a slide that you see, and, and rightfully so. It's a, it's a critical problem. And, and so the way that we were addressing the problem uh, or asking the question why aquaculture uh, is because a lot of people didn't know at the time that we farm more fish than we do cattle. Um, and so it, it may not seem, you know, depending on which uh, part of the country or which part of the world uh, you currently live in, uh, this may not be apparent uh, that we farm more fish than beef. 
and and few people knew um, that in the U.S., seafood is our highest uh, U.S. trade deficit, second highest only to crude oil. Um, and and there was a time that it was the highest. So aquaculture was a, was a fast growing market, continues to be a fast growing market. And so this was one of the things that we were showing to demonstrate the main challenge that that faced aquaculture or fish and shrimp production. And you can see, you know, over a, a long period of time, over 20 years leading up to 2016, aquaculture production, the red line was was going up significantly. And the main ingredient that was supplying uh, uh, its feed was fish meal, and it was dropping precipitously. So you had this ingredient supply issue into a market that was growing very, very quickly. Um, And and that was constraining growth at at different periods. And so with every challenge comes an opportunity, and this was really an opportunity for plant-based alternative protein ingredients to step in. But the challenge was you had to, you know, there was this very nice economic advantage if you could uh, produce a plant protein that had a composition and a performance that was similar to fish meal. So not, not an easy challenge. If, if you could accomplish that challenge, then you can see there was significant economic advantage um, to, to doing that. Now, as, as we got into this further, you know, we, we recognized that the, the challenge was really much, much bigger than how we were going to supply a growing population with food. Because as, as you can see here, there was a publication a number of years ago called Planetary Boundaries. And what Planetary Boundaries is, it's a framework to identify uh, risk, uh, in particular environmental risk. And, and we use that framework to identify how to make positive change. So we, we talk a lot about uh, climate change. Uh, we talk about ocean acidification. We, we talk about a lot of different things. But rarely are we talking about phosphorus and nitrogen and the impact that it's having in the environment. Uh, So this is down in the lower left-hand corner, biochemical flows. And when you look at where a great deal of phosphorus and nitrogen in the environment comes from, uh, it it comes from its use in agriculture. So this really started to change or shape the way that we were thinking about how we were going to develop the business. So when you use that as a backdrop, um, you know, why why was soy a focus for us to reduce our risk? Well, as you can see here, soy protein uh, is a majority of the plant-based protein that's, that's grown in the world. And you can see the comparison to wheat protein and, and pea protein here. So soy was a good starting point from that perspective. But you can also just read, uh, and there's, you can't really say it better than how USDA says it, um, soy is a great starting point. And so you know, if, if you quickly kind of scan through the words, uh, that the USDA uses, uh, incredibly land efficient, nitrogen fixing, conservation uses, climate smart, keys to, to global food security, highly nutritious, nitrogen fixing, carbon sequestering, adaptive, drought resilient, water efficiency, uh, not overly demanding of global water resources, twice as much protein per acre, uh, inherent sane, uh, sustainability, uh, but the last phrase is very interesting, contingent upon it being directly consumed by humans, not by farmed animals and then humans. So, you know, again, as you as you peel back the layer of the challenge that we were looking at, that's a very important uh, statement of, of how do we get plant based proteins directly into human foods? Well, so this was this is also very interesting, because if you look at soy farming and then soy processing, you can see that just on a dry matter basis, um, the importance of upcycling uh, processing byproducts. And you can see uh, uh, 20% of the soybean uh, component is oil, 80%, 80% of of the the component of soybean is is soybean meal. So that's a a big mass that that needs to be dealt with as as an oil byproduct. So you start to think about how do we get from point A to point B? Because on the left-hand side, you can see that a lot of the soybean meal that gets produced today is going into animal feed. 97% of soybean meal is currently going into animal uh, feed where 3% is being used in food products. So big disparity in in terms of of that. And then if you look on the right-hand side of, of this chart, 
you can see that we're not expecting a decrease in animal protein consumption. In fact, you can see in this chart, there's a significant increase that we're expecting as, as, the, as the global society you know, continues to, uh, to evolve, we're eating more and more animal protein. So the comment is you know, that this transition to plant-based diets, uh, it, the transition itself may not be sexy, but it's very, very important because we're not going to flip on a switch where everything that we consume overnight is, is entirely plant-based. So we're, we're very interested and focused on that transition. Now, so, so that was really answering the question, you know, why start with soy? So then we shifted to uh, what's the business case for aquaculture or why aquaculture? And, and there's three important reasons here that I'll show you very quickly. Uh, the, the first is efficiency. And if you look at the blue uh, arrow, feed conversion ratio for fish, many of you know, is one for one. So that's a pretty good business case for getting plant-based proteins into humans as efficiently as possible. You know, one, one unit of, of plant-based protein into one unit of, of fish or shrimp protein uh, compared to chickens, pigs, and, and cattle. So that, that's one reason, efficiency. The other reason is nutrition. There, there are, and, and again, it's, it's been studied um, by many people, how nutritious seafood is as a, as a source of, of animal protein. And then, and then lastly, there are some major efforts going on uh, within um, the, the seafood production industry like best aquaculture practices that are focused on how do we raise this animal protein in the most sustainable way possible. So there, there is a strong case for, for aquaculture as an important transition step for plant-based proteins going directly into humans. Now, again, kind of finishing up how the story has changed, uh, this is what's happening recently. And, and so you can see, and, and you've probably heard in the news, that uh, renewable, DC, renewable diesel, or the, that biofuel capacity, is truly skyrocketing. And, and you can see the existing capacity that we had over the last few years and what's currently under construction and what's been announced by major companies that are producing uh, renewable diesel. Well, one of the feedstocks into renewable diesel is soybean oil uh, and other vegetable oils. And so what that creates is this significant demand for vegetable oils that's pulling it away from other markets, and it's creating this huge glut of protein meal and, and soybean meal in particular. And, and this is just one projection that are we going to need 30 million more acres of, of U.S. soybeans in order to satisfy the biofuel demand? Um, and, and again, there are a number of different projections out there, but the number is big no matter how you look at it. So there's this glut of soybean meal. And, and I can tell you that the growth rates for pigs and chickens is not going to increase uh, significantly enough to take up this much soybean meal. And so Again, I, I use all of that as a backdrop for you know how, as an entrepreneur, you, you're watching different market forces and and they're changing constantly. And so it's important that you have a foundational story, but you have to be flexible and adaptive enough to you know to be able to evolve your story with how the market uh, is also evolving. So so what serves as our foundation? Well, I, the technology started on a piece of paper. There, there were two professors at South Dakota State University, as Phil mentioned. Um, it, one was an industrial microbiologist, one was a fish nutritionist, and the fish nutritionist was looking at that problem of how do we make a plant-based protein like soybean meal look more like fish meal? And the, the microbiologist looked at the problem and said, listen, we can ferment uh, the, the plant-based protein. We can ferment soybean meal, and we can not only increase its protein content, but we can alter its, its, uh, its composition and its functionality to actually solve a number of other challenges that are inherent in aquaculture, uh, as well as human health and nutrition. So you can see here, uh, we take a plant uh, through a sterile aerobic fermentation with a non-GMO yeast-like fungus, and we come out on the other side with a 70 plus percent product that we call ME Pro or microbially enhanced protein that has ultra high nitrogen and phosphorus digestibility. Now, as part of ongoing research, because you're never done answering questions, we have a feedstock development program looking at other plant-based material 
and we have an application development program looking at how do we have a positive impact on the health and wellness of other species. So just in terms of the mechanism of action, you can see taking a soybean that's 37% protein, uh, you extract the oil uh, to get to a 47% protein, and then we take that through our microbial enhancement to get to 75% protein. And that serves as a technology platform for us to do a number of different things with some of the other components that you see here, like the polysaccharides. Now, one of the benefits that we saw from fermentation is that not only are we utilizing uh, a lot of the sugars uh, that, that uh, different animal species and even humans are intolerant to, like the oligosaccharides, but our, our organism is a prolific enzyme producer. So we're, we're essentially hydrolyzing and, and reducing the size of the proteins in plant-based material into very small peptides, which are very easy to digest. And, they, and it looks very much like uh, compare, uh, competitive animal proteins. So with the help, and, and this is why the title of my presentation is It Takes a Village, w literally with the help of a village, uh, we worked with local economic development organizations. We, we worked with a number of the uh, large crop commodity groups uh, like uh, corn and soy. Um, and, and we worked with a number of different organizations that really helped us stand up a pilot scale facility. It, it's very unique. Uh, we have uh, a number of uh, ferment, fermenters of different sizes so that we could adjust uh, processing conditions. Uh, it, it has a feed mill so that we can immediately take an ingredient that was produced with uh, certain process conditions into what our customer would experience. You know, our customers are feed manufacturers. So we wanted to understand how they were going to experience our ingredient. And then we also have a recirculating aquaculture system on site. So we would immediately take the extruded feed and put it into a, a certain aquaculture species to, to determine how the species was going to react to different process conditions. And so this, this closed loop uh, innovation cycle that we created uh, is really unique. And you, and you learned a lot about the process um, very, very quickly. So again, a lot of help uh, that we had to get to, to this point. So we, we've reached uh, commercial production in 2019 uh, with the help of uh, some very uh, good investors, uh, investors who believed in our, our vision and, and who believed in the team to execute on the vision. And, and you can see here uh, just a, depiction, a 3D depiction of our, our facility here in South Dakota. Uh, we buy 55,000 tons of soybean meal per year, and we produce 30,000 uh, tons of, of our product, ME Pro, in addition to two co-products. Um, and we'll talk about that here in just a minute. One of the things that we learned uh, from our customers is the importance of these uh, certifications that you see here on the outside of the slide. Um, so in order to sell into a number of different countries around the world, these certifications were very, very important. They, they set industry standards uh, so that we're, we're bringing high quality ingredients into, this, into these food production systems. So our, our, our mission statement of bringing better plant-based products to, to food producers uh, really revolves around a position of better material source, better product performance, and better environmental impact. So that's the value that we want to bring to food producers. And, and you can see where we're located right in the middle of sustainable U.S. soy production. Uh, and, and we're very fortunate through a strategic supplier, uh, which was a, another key to our success early on, is that we have preferential access to expeller pressed, non-genetically modified soybean meal, which is, which is our number one feedstock. And then through over the course of time, uh, we have built a, our own version of field to fork. And, and you can see that we work upstream to the soybean farmers and work with them on the type of genetics that they plant and, and the type of agronomic practices that they use. And, and one of the reasons that we do that is because it's important to our customers and, and, and the end consumers where that ingredient uh, ultimately comes from all the way back to the field. And so we work very hard to tell that story. And then there are people in the industry that will recognize that story. And uh, Jason Mann is a nutritionist for uh, Riverence, who is the largest uh, trout producer in the Western hemisphere. 
uh, in his testimonial, he's recognizing um, the importance of uh, traceability and sustainability. And then, uh, you know, here in um, uh, with Sumaqua, Sumaqua is the largest shrimp hatchery in Central America. We've, we've learned that because of the fermentation process, uh, we're actually reducing Vibrio col uh, colonies. And that bacteria causes early mortality uh, syndrome in shrimp. And so the ability to reduce uh, disease in a very large shrimp hatchery means that they have more shrimp that can make it into ponds on the farms. And, and that drops directly to their bottom line. And then from an environmental impact standpoint, uh, Peter Fritsch uh, runs Rushing Waters uh, Fisheries in Wisconsin. Uh, he's the largest trout supplier to Whole Foods. He was facing a different challenge where the Department of Natural Resources in Wisconsin uh, had lowered the phosphorus discharge limits from farms and he was at a much higher level uh, just be simply because of the feed that he was using. And so as opposed to putting in a, a very expensive wastewater treatment, we worked with Peter on changing his feed to a higher uh, inclusion level of ME Pro. And we brought down his phosphorus discharge below the levels uh, that the Department of Natural Resources was, was worried about. And again, largely due to our increase uh, in available phosphorus because of the fermentation process. So a lot of that, um, practical work in the field with, with real customers in real operating environments led to recognition that, that became very important to us as we began selling the product. And, and so you can see here, our aquaculture feed customer base is uh, around the world. Um, we have certain major markets that we focus on, but the species and the geographic diversity that we've been able to get product out to helps reduce our risk. And it also seeds growth for future production expansion. So lastly, again, in our continued quest to get uh, plant-based uh, ingredients directly into food applications, we've done a significant amount of testing in both pet food and human food. And it's been very successful. Uh, we have unique health and wellness benefits that we're bringing. And so we're very excited to be launching uh, those new products in those, in those markets. So again, back to, you know, macroeconomic trends that, that you want to keep your eye on to support your story as you're, as you're building your, your technology, building and scaling your technology. We, we've had post-pandemic aquaculture growth and an ingredient shortage, which is fueling uh, our demand. We've had pandemic-induced pet adoption, and, and so pet food is growing and it's humanizing, and so plant-based proteins are becoming a very important uh, ingredient source in pet foods. Uh, you've also, you all know and, and see the, that plant-based food alternatives are driving soy protein growth. Soy protein is a, an important component of many plant-based uh, food products. And, and lastly, again, looking at renewable diesel and the U.S. soy crush growth is creating a significant glut of soybean meal, which is going to bring down the price of that protein meal as well as other protein meals. So, just as we're looking at the valorization of soybean meal as the, as the byproduct of soy processing for soy oil, we too look at our co-product stream. And our co-product stream is soy solubles. And there are a number of very interesting things in soy solubles that we continue to mine through our R&D. And so, you know, kind of from simplest to more complex in terms of mining the opportunity in that co-product stream, we will pull out uh, soy oil, single cell protein, peptone and peptides, as well as soluble polysaccharides. And what we'll be left with is a very interesting platform of, of sugar rich media for precise fermentation applications, which I'm sure a number of you on the call uh, are, have, are very interested in or, or have technologies uh, that are looking for uh, sugar rich media. And as we've, as we've developed our intellectual property, you know, one of the things that we've been very um, uh, astute about is what's, what's happening around us and where are we trying to go in terms of our commercial application. And so uh, just as I mentioned before, we have a feedstock development program. Our intellectual property estate covers a number of different um, uh, plant-based commodities. Uh, and then we've also been very strategic about how we make sure that our intellectual property is covering important regions around the world, um, you know, crop, uh, livestock, 
and population uh, areas need to be aligned with your, with your intellectual property strategy. And I guess the last comment that I would make, uh, but just before opening it up for questions is, um, I, you know, I, the, the most important thing that I've learned as an entrepreneur is how important it is to put, um, you know, not only really smart people around you that have diverse uh, experiences, um, but, but people that, that believe in the vision and, and believe in the mission that you're, that you're you, know, you know, taking the hill on every single day. So, you know, surrounding yourself with that team of people uh, and, and our, our leadership team, are, we consider ourselves guardians of nitrogen and phosphorus, uh, which is the reference to the guardians of the galaxy here. Um, so I'm very fortunate to have a, a very strong team of people around me. So with that, Phil, uh, I'll, I'm happy to answer any questions. Thanks, Mark. Let's, let's start with uh, one of the questions from the audience. Uh, one of one of your latter slides, I think, um, addressed it. But we've got an audience member who wants wants to know if whether or not the the fermentation platform could work on other, um, you know, protein raw materials coming out of the the ag industry like uh, DDGS or or other uh, protein sources from uh, alternative oil seeds or alternative grains. So let's let's start there. <clears throat> No, that's, and that's a great, it's a great question. One of the things that we learned early on as we were testing uh, different feedstock, um, you know, we were using small business grants uh, from the federal government. So think National Science Foundation, U.S. Department of Agriculture. Um, they were very instrumental in, a, in allowing us to test, you know, how far could we take the fermentation platform? And it also helped narrow our focus you know, in terms of what was the one moonshot that we were going to take, which ended up being soy to start with. Um, but we've done a lot of testing on distiller's grains um, and, and have had uh, significant success. Uh, you know, again, canola meal, um, a lot of the, the large acre, um, you know, in terms of number of acre uh, crops, uh, we've tested the fermentation platform and it, and it works exceptionally well. Now, again, what's the you have to ask the question, why fermentation? What are you trying to accomplish with fermentation? And, and as a lot of you know, I, the, in plant-based material, uh, unlocking the bioavailability of, of nitrogen and phosphorus is, is a key element. Uh, and, it, and it's one of the big things that we point to in terms of why fermentation. So unlocking the value of nitrogen and phosphorus in, in plant-based materials. And, and we also have to think about two things. Uh, well, three things really: the the nutritional aspects. How do we make the most out of the composition that we're given? Um, how how do we improve the the health and wellness benefits that we can get from plant based ingredients? And and we found that fermentation allows us to do that. And then, are there opportunities to increase the functionality of that uh, crop based material, that plant based material, uh, be, because of the fermentation process and uh, complementary downstream processes. And, and so I, I guess a long way to answer the question, Phil, it, it does work with other uh, plant-based material, but you have to go in kind of knowing, you know, what, what are the problems that you want to solve or the, the opportunities that you're trying to create. Great, great, Mark. We've got several others are uh, pouring in, but they, um, they actually have relevance to all the speakers. Um, and so let's hold off on a few of those until, uh, until the round table, um, you're, you're, um, <laughs> you're being too kind to your organization about what they had to do uh, <laughs> during COVID. <laughs> you know, you talked about the, the tailwinds that ar arose after COVID, but uh, uh, let's talk uh, in the round uh, table about freedom to commercialize, freedom to operate, if you will, from a, a regulatory standpoint and how just uh, some of the crazy scenarios that occurred during the uh, during the pandemic. The audience needs to hear those too, particularly uh, entrepreneurs who are, are just getting started because I know none, none of us uh, planned on those things uh, and yet they happened. And, uh, and you're still, uh, the company's still standing and thriving. So, so I think there are lessons to be learned there. So thanks, thanks again, Mark. And we'll uh, look forward to, to you joining here in a little bit when we get to the round robin. Okay, we want to move next to um, to Purus and uh, and Tyler. 
as uh, as as CEO. Um, He's uh, CEO of Purist Proteins, and he's also a board member of the Purist family of companies. Uh, you know, uh, Tyler will make reference to, uh, there's a long history here, almost uh, uh, since the mid-80s of, of Purist, and he'll, he'll uh, touch on that uh, briefly because it sets the stage for a lot of the things that uh, Purist has done uh, in the last 10 years since... Uh, Tyler's joined the company, but there's a foundation there that has been quite impactful, and I'm sure you'll enjoy uh, hearing that. Um, so um, Tyler's uh, academic training is, has been in uh, international uh, business management um, at the University of uh, Connecticut. Uh, go Hus. Um, and he just, in his spare time, he was a uh, captain and the uh, starting quarterback of the school's football team. So again, uh, not enough uh, free time in his uh, his day. Uh, that passion continued on after uh, after his undergraduate training, where he went into the uh, uh, National Football League as an undrafted free agent. And we know how challenging that path can be, but he was successful. Uh, eventually, um, <clears throat> made it to the New Orleans Saints. Uh, who dat, uh, Tyler? And uh, oh, by the way, in the midst of all of that, was on a Super Bowl winning uh, team. So he's had some incredible life experiences and I'm sure the you know the commitment to training and consistency and competition uh, you know carries through even to uh, the daily activities that that he leads uh, the team at, at Purus about so so with that uh, intro uh, Tyler we're gonna turn it over to you and hear the Purus uh, story thank you Phil and I think I, I got my screen shared are we good on that end I'm seeing it um, All right. perfect so it's, uh, it's, it's always funny hearing uh, stories about the, the good old football days. And, you know, oftentimes I get caught using sports analogies here at Purist and not everyone played sports. And you quickly learn there's a big difference between sports and business. Some things are applied, no doubt, leadership, hard work, persistence, all of those things. But in the end, uh, business is an all the time thing. And, and sports is it's a sometimes thing. And I, boy, did I find that out quick. And uh, did, did I need to learn a bunch to catch up with all of you folks that, that are, are leading and paving the way in this industry? I did have the uh, a fortunate ability of growing up with uh, an innovator, an entrepreneur, a dreamer. And I'll share that story with you. And you know, listening to Mark's uh, talk was really encouraging because being front end on new ideas can get exhausting. And early on in our journey, it was constant exhaustion. It was almost like no one believed that plant-based proteins could be something. That's what Purist does. And then things change and I'll go through the story, but I think we can all uh, are all aware that in the past couple of years, the amount of investment, the social awareness, the news and the excitement around plant-based food and, and specifically plant-based meat was at an all-time high. And sitting here today in right before harvest of 2022, that same excitement may not be shared by everyone. And the people that are jumping into the industry because, oh, wow, this is the next greatest thing. Maybe they're not so sure, or, or maybe some of the pizzazz that, that is on the headlines is going in reverse. And that tension, that feeling, those social forces can work against you. And so today, like my hope is understanding that many of you want to be entrepreneurs or are and are building companies. And on the journey of growth, it can be scary. It does feel like you're down by 20 at the beginning of the game. But in the end, there's multiple, multiple plays to play. There's many days to work. And if you believe enough, you can build and don't be uh, distracted by the headlines. My, one of my coaches in college always said, don't read your press clippings because the media loves you when you're killing it and they hate you when you're not killing it. So that is more than true today. And I, hopefully I can share a little bit why, one, I think the plant-based industry is just getting started and uh, what, what we'll do to grow. So with, with anything, uh, there's 
ups and downs. There's beginnings, there's ends. Maybe sometimes things continue on. And I can tell you a story of a, of a guy. Uh, he, he saw the world as slightly different. He was a district feed salesman for Purina, of all things, and sold compound feed to hog lots. He was also a football player in college, a standout star at Iowa State, and he interned for Asgro and learned how to be a plant breeder. And the long story short is my dad dreamed up of where we would be someday all the way back in 1985. So when the media turns against plant-based, this is where we've been all along, building what we think is a sustainable future and starting in extremely humble beginnings. My dad and mom were 24 years old when they started the company. Uh, I was just born and my sister was two. Fast forward to today, we run the company together and the vision of making foods from plants is as real as it ever could be. We have a belief that, and I'll, I'll explain this in detail, but if you can start with great seeds that farmers wanna grow, that have a nutritional focus, but also a functional focus to make great food, and you build ingredients that can make great food, and then you actually make great food, people love to eat it. And it won't feel like a compromise, and it won't feel like they're missing out on something that's great. And that's today what Purist is all about. We we, we want to bring Jerry's belief and bias 47 years ago at this point, or 37 actually to be exact, and make it as real as real can be. And a lot of people get caught up in our industry arguing, is plant-based better? Is, is um, precision fermentation better? Is animal proteins better? And that's all good. The, the point being is we have huge problems that we have to address and we have to solve it. With, you may have heard, but the, the amount of acute hunger that's happening today due to the supply chain issues, Ukraine, the high cost of energy is double than what it was in 2019. So people are literally starving and it's up to innovators like us and everyone on this call to do something about it. And frankly, that's our obligation and I'll share a little bit about Pierce's story and how we see the world, but there's certainly going to be a multitude of solutions. We happen to choose plants, and I'll tell you more about that story. So what do we do? So building our model, we call it seed to scale. And as an entrepreneur, I think that statement is super important, is how do you build a model that you can control, but also can grow? And it's not as easy to do as it is to say. So our model is what we have on the page here is a seven step process. It starts with genetics. This was two decades of work building proprietary seed genomes that then could be grown by farmers and purchased back to be merchandised. We wanna create value in the value chain. It took 20 years to build a business that could cash flow on its own. So we can then invest in the next decade. That's when I jumped in. In 2011, I was playing pro football for the New Orleans Saints, and I thought, this is what I'm going to do for a while. But one thing is for sure, much like business, the NFL is humbling, and it stands for not for long. So don't get it twisted. National Football League is what it's advertised, but the truth is, for many players, me included, it stands for not for long. So I was on the street. I got fired from my dream job three times in three years. Talk about humbling. So what did I do? Well, I hung out with my best friend who happened to be my dad, Jerry Lorenzen, and talked about, well, where do you see Purus going? At the time, it was called World Food Processing. We had roughly 30 people on our team in our company, and he, he believed that we could transition our soybeans to soy protein isolates, and that could be a, a really great opportunity. So we borrowed some money, uh, some very risky money, I should say, and we bought a plant. It was a soy protein isolate plant. It's been around since the 1950s in Wisconsin. And I went and visited, this is December of 2011, and we bought it. And next thing you know, we had no sales. And so who was the closest guy standing around to go solve that problem? You're looking at him. So myself and a gentleman named Kashal Chandak were employee one and two 
of purest proteins, which at the time uh, had no customers, had no reason to have a customer, and but we had a really cool plant that could do some things. So we we went on. We we're going to be a non-GMO and soy pro non-GMO and organic, I should say, hexane-free soy protein manufacturer. We're going to take over the world. And then I met the equivalent of the New England Patriots, the Indianapolis Colts in Soleil and ADM. And every time we would find a great opportunity, invent the protein, we would get specced out from Soleil and ADM. So we looked at the, we looked at it and said, hmm, what could we do? In this time of the, in our, our, our development, if you can rewind back to 2012, the Just Label It campaign was really big. Uh, talking about GMOs, non-GMOs, can, should we label them? These are in our food, why didn't anyone tell us? And it was the talk of the world, as well as people were transitioning from where they got their information. We all know where we get our information today, it's online, but more specifically, it's on Google. And at that time, we looked at, well, what's Google saying about soy? As a pro football player, I was very clear in my position. Plant-based proteins uh, at all stages of life can power a healthy diet. I consumed many of them. I was definitely pro uh, soy. And I was told I was crazy. You have to eat milk. You have to eat whey. You have to eat meat. Otherwise, you can't be a, a pro football player. And you go online and you realize Google is not a truth engine. It is a search engine. And the narrative around soy was a struggle. Uh, people were talking about GMOs for sure. They were talking about hexing for sure. They, they were talking about other studies that had some correlation, but probably weren't the case around human nutrition. And so we thought, well, what, what could we do? And in 2004, I, I walked through our field in Iowa uh, with my dad and he showed me peas. And if anyone grows or has been around Iowa, there's not a lot of peas in Iowa. Now, I'll show you a map in a second, but mostly peas are grown in Canada and in the northern United States. So my dad, the innovator like he is, saw it differently. He said, why can't peas grow in the south? What would need to be true to get them to grow down here? At 12 years old, I was in charge of our corn breeding program. Every year, I'd spend my summers walking through the cornfield and doing top crosses and selfs of corn, which basically means I'm in corn, taking the pollen from the top and pouring it onto the ear. And when it, when it has a silk, the strings that come out of the corn. And pardon me if you all know what all of this means. I talk to a lot of sales and marketing people and they don't. So nonetheless, I'm crossing corn and I hate it. If anyone's detasseled, walked through a cornfield, it is tough work, very hot, very sticky, itchy, all the same course, leaned on my football days, hired all my teammates. That's what I did. So leaving to go to college, which was 2004, and my dad shows me all these peas. I think he's crazy. I'm like, dad, what are you doing? Like, why are you growing all these peas? Like, peas don't grow here. These peas look terrible, by the way. They barely were growing in the dirt. And he said, no, Tyler, you don't get it. You don't understand. We need more biodiversity. Farmers need more options. We have to develop peas to grow further south so they can grow at different times in the year and farmers would have more opportunity to grow cover crops and to valorize their, their land. Most specifically, organic farmers need options. We have to develop peas that can grow everywhere. And I looked at him and said, well, maybe you get it, I sure don't. So I go off, I'm playing football, fast forward back to 2012. And I called my dad, I was like, you know what? Google's really struggling with soy and we're just having a tough time really getting into the new brands. What if we made pea protein? He laughed at me. He said, well, soy protein is the best and you can't make peas taste as good as you can make our soybeans taste. So that's going to be difficult. And I challenged him and said, well, I think there's a real opportunity here. How's that pea breeding program going? He's like, oh, that's going great. We're growing in Kansas. We're growing in Arkansas. We're going all over the place. We're adapting peas to a Southern climate so they can grow at different times of the year, disease resistance, drought tolerance, et cetera, et cetera. And I was like, dad, I believe our business is going to pivot to a pea protein company. Do you trust me? 
And he said, if you can cush and prove to me that it tastes as good or better than our soy proteins, I'm in, do it. This last decade, we've spent 10 years scaling up our pea protein business. It went from an idea to a trial to, whoa, we have something to our customers going from very small to launching in Costco, Walmart, Target, you name it. It's been crazy. And you can imagine when that type of market happens, you have to respond. We've been sold out for a very long time. And I'll tell you a little bit more about that uh, on where we're going and, and how we're going to get there. The last step of our business and really the future, the next decade, is how we take our ingredients and make it into food. As I mentioned, we're an end-to-end -end food company, plant-based food company. Always have been, always will. We've been building the integrated model from seed up since 1985. So when you talk about genetics, people forget how important the seed is. There's been massive consolidation of germplasm over the past 20, 30 years with the rise of GMO seeds, and that is fine. Our model was just different. We didn't want to uh, be a GMO company. We're trying to be a food company. And at that time, our genetic base was focused about higher protein. So on the soy side, what does that mean? So we have protein varieties that are 39 to 40% protein, which is really meaningful, especially what Mark is talking about with soybean meal and things of that nature. How do you get more protein per acre so we can feed more people? And we always look at ways to not only make the seed vibrant and nutrition, but how do you make it taste like nothing? The best soybeans taste like nothing. So then you can make ingredients that taste like milk or taste like meat or taste like eggs. And we'll, we'll share a little bit more of that. On corn, we took a little different approach. It's always been about how do we build drought tolerant and more sustainable corn. Uh, so we have a very large short corn breeding program. I kid you not, I bred corn that was as tall as my knees for many years, all the taller it got. And we've developed this. So these varieties are typically four foot shorter than um, most varieties that are hybrids today. And we're really strong in our inbred program. It's, it's something that we continue to invest in because uh, we believe it's important for the future. And then last but not least, certainly our peas. Uh, that program is pretty old at this point. Uh, we have multiple patented varieties. We're about 30% higher protein than, than peas that are grown. Uh, in Canada and, and in the typical climate. Uh, we also have proven that we have 55% increase in yield in certain uh, varieties and a bunch in the pipeline, a heavy amount of investment in our pea program. So where are we at? We're all across the US, all the gray states are where our, our main procurement is. You can see the different cities. Uh, those are areas where we have manufacturing plants. Uh, they're all do something different. We have wet extraction facilities. That's how you make soy protein isolates, uh, excuse me, pea protein isolates, also how you make soy protein isolates as well. Uh, we make starch and fiber and those things. We have dry mills as well, where we're grinding up peas and, and fiber and, and cleaning the rock sticks and stems out of the products. And then we have soy facilities that are focused on non-GMO grain. And that's, that's largely for export and servicing the Mexican customers. Our big investment in infrastructure and really been my focus for the past four years was getting the funding to build this plant that you see. It's, uh, this picture was taken in 2021 uh, in the summer, right as we were finishing construction and commissioning of the facility. Uh, we started the plant up in, in October, excuse me, October of 2021, but full production uh, in December of 2021. So we've been ramping up production all year this year. And so how do we do it? During the process of raising capital, the first was how do we get some capital that sees the world the way we see it? Uh, we were fortunate enough to find family offices that believed in the vision. Mm -hmm. One happened to have a, a major exit in the CPG landscape, and they believed that the upstream part of this business is as valuable as the downstream. So they invested in Purist as well as another family office that was in the egg supply chain and they, they understood what the cost of vertically integrated value add specialty really means. And so that was good. You know, we have family offices, long hold period. Uh, they're just like us. They're family that's trying to build a company. But we had to really scale up. 
and we needed north of $100 million to build this facility. It was a, a brownfield. I can get into that a little bit. But as we were exploring, I grew up, uh, I went to high school in Eddyville, Iowa. And if any of you've been there, you know that there's a giant corn wet mill that's ran by cargo. And during practice, uh, during football practice, you can smell uh, the corn wet mill. It smells like Wheaties, in my opinion. Uh, it should be more like cornflakes, apparently. But nonetheless, uh, I, I, I grew up seeing the scale of what cargo could do. And we were thinking about, well, what's important to Puris and what are we trying to do? And in the end, like, why did we start all of this? And my dad calls it protein independence. This, this idea, if you could grow, make, and eat protein, not just produce it from certain regions and ship it all across the world, truly grow it near you in the most efficient way possible. That's the best way to go after this protein gap of the future. And we thought there was not a better partner that has a size, a scale, and the ability to feed protein. This one just happened to be from peas than Cargill's. So we did a partnership with them, a uh, joint venture. I run that joint venture. It's called Purist Proteins. And they are a minority partner and invested a significant amount of capital so we can help grow and be the leaders of, of, of this industry. We have two uh, wet protein plants at this point, one in uh, Turtle Lake, Wisconsin, one in Dawson, Minnesota. Both of them are brownfields. We looked at what the utility infrastructure we needed, and we found those assets, purchased those assets, gutted those assets, and built our process in there. Uh, these, these facilities have now driven over 200 uh, jobs in rural America, towns of less than 1,000 people uh, in Minnesota and Wisconsin. This is an absolute massive success uh, from a partnership and Cargill supporting us in our dream to build uh, this facility. It's running 24-7. Uh, things are going very, very well, and it supports a, a significant amount of pea volume through the facility, which is uh, exciting. We're roughly 50% of North American production capacity of pea protein, and then there's been a, a nearly a billion dollars of investment over the past two years. We did it slightly cheaper than that, thank goodness. So what can you make? Well, we like to say anything that you want, and we want it to taste great. So we, we spent a ton of time building applications and proof points that showcase what plants can truly do if you don't compromise on ingredients, you don't compromise on supply chains, you don't compromise on nutritional characteristics because there's many products on the market today that are compromising. And I think that gets back to this moment, this moment where plant-based is losing some of its sizzle. And people are doubting that you know plant-based was a farce People aren't buying it as much. You know, people are trading down in a looming recession. Inflation is causing people not to be able to afford healthy food. This is the narrative. So will the plant-based industry respond and just let the narrative run? Or will we do something about it? Will we continue to innovate? Will we find ways to make food taste better, healthier, and also affordable? all while being clearly more sustainable for the planet. That argument is not even close. Mark talked about the use of land, you know, talked about the amount of animals that are used to feed people. There's a significant amount, 80 billion land animals slaughtered a year to feed us 8 billion people. How are we gonna do that when it's 10 billion? Like we have to address these problems and we can, and you can through plants, but it must be with no compromise. We have to make the products taste better. They have to be more affordable and they have to deliver on their nutrition promise over and above what, where we're at today. And I, I know we can get there. And one of our beliefs is that movement to consumer products. We launched our first a consumer product. We, we had one back in the day, actually. Um, anyways, it's tangent. It's a great story, but I'll leave it for another time. Uh, we launched our first one, all plant-based just recently, and it's called AcreMade. AcreMade is a plant-based egg brand, a really a platform of innovation, leveraging the ingredients that are built by Purist Proteins to take them and make innovation around plant-based eggs. And it's a, it's a market that's growing rapidly. Uh, people are looking for this. When you look at avian flu and what's happened on the, the supply chains of chicken eggs, you realize the fragility of an animal-based supply chain only. And will everyone switch over? Probably not. But can you give people options that deliver on the promise of great taste, 
health and nutrition. This is what AcreMade stands for and really is what it's about. How do we build it? Well, we were developing these innovations and really wanted to figure out where, where should we play? How do we create more value? How do we show what's possible with plants? Let's just build one ourselves. Let's see how it goes. Let's get some funding and build. So we did that, a two-year project. We believe we have the best tasting plant-based egg on the market. It's functional, it's low cost, and it is very, very versatile. Uh, it's a shelf-stable product. So you're able just to add water like you're making pancakes and next thing you know, you scramble it up and it tastes literally just like an egg or add it to your baked goods or uh, make patties, different things. There's a lot of excitement here and this is a totally separate business than the one I run, but we bring the same values. We bring the same mission of you know what's possible with plants and let's make food that we can love forever. And that's what Pyrrhus is all about. For me, I share all that with you because the market forces, the technology forces, the economic forces, the political forces, they will happen. Sometimes they'll be on your side. Sometimes they'll be against you. Do you have the, the determination to not care, to keep pursuing forward, pivoting, being ag agile and finding a way to make it better? Because if you do that, you always have a chance. And that's something I know is in the culture of purists because my dad and my mom, and they, they did all of that hard work when we had no chance. And so my job is to scale it. Nicole, my sister, job to scale it. And all 350 people that work at our company today, this team can make it happen. We do it through partnerships. So we're eager to reach out and, and learn more about what others are doing, how we can help and way we can make our business better than it is today because there's surely room to grow. So with that, Bill, that's that's what I have. Uh, thank you so much for having me on this panel and I'm eager to see the next presentation and was definitely inspired by Mark's. Excellent, uh, uh, Tyler. Um, I, I wanna get to, to Baljit, but there's a there's a uh, question coming from the audience that I think is relevant for both you and for Mark. Uh, and that is uh, given where you guys operate in the Northern Plains and in, uh, in rural areas, uh, we all know talent uh, rules the day. And, and so be thinking about uh, how you would answer, how do, I, how do I recruit the kind of talent that I need in kind of a specialty you know, business uh, into these areas of of the country that that uh, need to have the skills and expertise in order to make these kind of new and specialty products. So let's plant that seed, so to speak, <laughs> and we'll uh, we'll talk about that when we get to the um, uh, to the roundtable. Okay. So thanks. It's a great it's a great story on a very short uh, timeline. So I hope it inspires the audience to see what uh, from both uh, Prairie Aquatech and uh, and Purus in a uh, in a decade's worth of time, a world of uh, change can uh, can take place. So let's move to um, to uh, Sella Farms and uh, Baljit Gota. Um, there we there he is. Um, so Baljit's got an interesting uh, history here, uh, and he comes at it almost in uh, an interesting reverse uh, order. He's uh, he spent more than two decades uh, working in in the food sector of, of various uh, ag tech. He's served as a senior leadership in, in uh, technical leadership, especially in very large entities like uh, ADM. Um, he's also now done it through a, a couple of uh, startups. Uh, Nature's Find was, uh, was one, and then now uh, Sella Farms that we're gonna hear about uh, you know, this morning. And, and so, He's had the interesting experience to see startups from their very, very early days uh, from the perspective of, uh, you know, being in a very, very large company who might be interested in partnering, might be interested in, in investing. And so he has a unique perspective, I think, that, that many in the audience might be uh, interested in, in tapping into. Um, Baljit is co-founder and chief technology officer uh, at Sela. 
Uh, he's responsible for the innovation technology and the commercialization activities for the company. Um, his mission is to make Staples uh, healthier. Uh, you're going to hear a lot about baked goods that, that a lot of times you don't hear much in the uh, in the plant protein space, but we're going to hear about that uh, this morning. And um, <clears throat> so their their mission is to try to deliver through uh, an interesting range of um, uh, typical cereal-based applications uh, protein. And and so we're going to let him tell uh, tell the story. And so with that, Belgit. We'll turn it over to you and uh, look forward to hearing about the Sella, uh, Sella Farm story and your perspective. Thanks. All right, thank you. Um, I just want to make sure um, my slides are visible to everyone. Look and great. You can hear me okay. All good. Uh, thank you again, Phil. Um, and thank you uh, to the organizing committee as well as the UCS team for inviting Seller Farms here to to share you know some of the things we are we are doing here in alternate protein space, uh, which I will talk about. Um, so as uh, Phil mentioned, so I'm Baljeet Gotra, co-founder CTO of Seller Farms. Seller Farms is a food tech startup company uh, based here in Bay Area, California. Uh, we are on a mission to make foods healthier by bringing a paradigm shift in fermentation technology to produce these proteins. Uh, before I speak more about Sela and its technology, maybe let me start with the current state of alternate protein industry. Uh, both Mark and Tyler have really shared um, already about how important it is to grow more quality proteins to support the growing population. And then also we have to do it sustainably. So I'll just quickly um, reiterate a few of the things here, but also show some numbers. Um, so current uh, state of industry is, um, there's no doubt that we are expanding the alternate protein space rapidly. Despite the current headwinds we see that um, we hear about plant-based protein products, you know, both in alternate meat and dairy products are not hitting the taste and the other parity, um, cost parity, um, as well as texture. But despite all these things, we are still growing the space significantly. But it does point to like, what are the things we have to fix as well? So there are three base technologies in all proteins uh, space, you know, plant-based, uh, we, we heard from Tyler about peas and soybeans and then micro-based technologies, which I will share um, a bit about that, what Sela is doing, and also the animal cell-based. Um, all of these technologies are supporting growth of the alternate proteins. Um, as we look at R&D and, and, and what has been done in the past, it's tremendous um, um, uh, tremendous efforts went, went into how the cost can be decreased. And it is predicted that it will take three to 10 years to reach the cost parity, uh, particularly based on the technologies. Maybe plant protein offers you much quicker way to reach the cost parity as well as taste and texture, while some of the other technologies may take longer. Venture funding, government policies, regulatory bodies, are all in favor of all these technologies. And we saw this in recent announcements uh, that came from the, uh, from the, from the government here uh, in, in United States as well. Um, the increased adoption of these products globally, uh, it, that's where we need to focus more on. Clearly we learned how to increase adoption. Affordability is the key. Protein, uh, texture, taste, is very, very important. If we just hit, achieve just the affordability, then it's not gonna hit the mark because taste and texture is the king. And I will talk about that a little bit more. One other thing you know, I'll mention quickly is most of the time when we speak about alternate proteins, uh, we mostly talking about meat and dairy analogs uh, and you know, how industry is making it, uh, making those tastier and, uh, and, and affordable. But today you will see and hear a little bit different, you know, because there are other high high protein foods that consumers are also interested in. And I'll talk about that a little bit today. So we are unlocking the uh, 
mass adoption of alternate proteins um, and taste and texture we talked about healthier and shorter ingredient labels and one other thing is uh, consumer is seeking higher protein foods across the categories not just meat and dairy and why is that um, this is basically driven by the changing dynamics in the market space flexitarians are uh, are the uh, consumer who want to reduce dependence on meat-based foods. They are looking for options of skipping a meal that's based on animal-based proteins. Consumer, they are striving to find better for you food options. Now, industry has done great in the last six, seven years with the support from venture funding and a lot of great innovation that has happened where we have created several options, but mostly concentrated in the area of meat and dairy. What about the other foods? So Cellar Farms is looking at protein as a food ingredient that could go across all the food categories that we all eat three times a day. So there's a demand for more versatile protein options. Uh, now, needless to say this, our ag agriculture system is fundamental to our food system. And both Mark and uh, Tyler today stressed on that. You know, uh, this is so important to, to sustain the growing population. Meat, poultry, dairy are the largest protein categories combined, but they're not sustainable. Grain products constitute the second largest category after, after, after that, after meat, uh, which is, you know, the percent protein the to of total protein is, is the second highest but it lacks protein quality and taste. So at Cellar Farms, we are focused on leveraging the scale of grains and seeds, and we are going to make it healthier and affordable. And I'll share in the next few minutes how we are working on this mission. At Cellar, we are pioneering grain fermentation technology to make alternate proteins. We are positioning our technology to be the most affordable in producing clean tasting proteins for the food industry. And all, we are starting with uh, grains and essentially the grain in grain starch is the largest component and starch is also the source of energy for the, for the microbes that are used in fermentation. So we are converting grain starch to high protein grain flours. In this process, we are bumping up the proteins uh, almost by three to six times. So we can go all the way up to 80% protein uh, products, uh, which is, you know, in, in, which is in the form of dry powders. And more importantly, during this process of fermentation, we are, we are making it complete protein also. So they're all nine essential amino acids, which originally were lacking in the grains that we are using. So we are working with wheat grain. That's our first uh, product. That, that we are focused on. And you know, the protein quality score of wheat protein is very low, but by fermenting it, we can, we can grow, uh, we can make it a complete protein so that all nine essential amino acids are there. And in this process, we are reducing carbohydrate as well um, as that's used in uh, growing the microbial biomass. So with the technique, we are making our high protein flowers more versatile. Versatile in a way that it's cleaner in taste, it's highly nutritious, but most importantly, it's multifunctional because we are looking at adding it into very different food applications where the texture development is highly dependent on how your protein is interacting with water in, in, in different foods. And we'll talk about that a little bit more later. Our technology platform has a 360 degree approach. We start with discovery of microbes. And in this case, we, we are focused on protein quality. What is the protein quality looks like? And we have a pipeline of microbes and that we, uh, that we have uh, selected as we look at various sources of um, sources of uh, uh, food uh, safe microbes. We, we look at a variety of common and unusual food sources to find microbes that have a high nutrition. And then we, uh, we can predict their proteome in silico without doing too much of the experimentation 
and we can quickly arrive at a very good starting point. So we have this high quality microbes, which are then uh, used in the fermentation technology that, that we have using grains as a substrate. And in the downstream processing, we have our proprietary techniques to make the protein not only good tasting, but highly functional, in having a different type of texture attributes as I've laid out on this right side of the screen. And these are some of the texture properties which are required to make food taste like uh, like, uh, like not, not only like uh, taste like how you perceive an original food. For example, if you are tasting a bread, which is a commonly made with uh, regular wheat flour, now you replace, you adding more proteins in, does it still taste like bread? And I will share about particularly more about high protein bread today, how we are making it happen. So there are several uh, food applications we are targeting uh, using different type of substrates. Uh, I talked about wheat earlier, and in wheat we are making um, we we are using products across you know most of the staple foods that we all love, whether it's a, a, a baked product, cereals, pizza, and tortillas, noodles, pasta, snacks. But we're also looking at other grain sources that are grown in plenty, like oats, rice, that offers us, offers us additional um, uh, avenues where, where, food, where you can make gluten-free food or the, or, the, or the food with some of the inherent, you know, uh, more pro better properties like, you know, oats, they give you, um, they considered the most healthy grain because of the fibers and other things that are that are already there in notes. So we are looking into leveraging all the native attributes of the other grains as well. So moving on to the bread, as I was mentioning earlier. So Seller's team is highly focused on making bread that tastes like bread. But we all have a love and hate relationship with bread. We, we love it, but at the same time, bread is also empty calories. You do not get much nutrition from it. But how we can make bread, which is commonly eaten staple across the globe, how we can make it healthy? So we have uh, come up with a breakthrough in nutrition where we deliver 10 grams of protein in one slice of bread. A leading brand of bread, which uh, many of uh, the uh, attendees and the uh, uh, everyone here is listening, um, they are aware of this brand, Dave Skiller brand. That bread has five grams of protein, but seller bread, we are delivering 10 grams of protein. And most importantly, this is a complete protein. It has all nine essential amino acids. And what are the potential uh, avenues of in terms of food applications here. So we take this bread, each slice contains 20 grams of proteins. You can come up with a lot of different meal options that flexitarian consumer are looking for. Here we are showing some of the sandwiches made with simple vegetables, or you can put your favorite cheese in it, what, what you like, and you can make it really uh, you know, a worthwhile meal for lunch or dinner or some other occasions. So we can deliver more than 20 grams of protein in very simple meals. And this is what Sela is on a mission uh, to, to deliver staples in a very healthier way. Now, this is another example where we are determined to put more protein in more other, in other staple foods like pasta a leading brand that we all are familiar with, delivers seven grams of protein, but we can deliver 15 grams of protein. And all of this protein is, is, has all the complete proteins in it that our, our body needs. So we are working on, this is our next product uh, that we are working on. Um, so this is my last slide here. Just want to maybe finish off by saying, our mission is to unlock mass adoption of alternate products, not just limited to burgers or sausages or dairy alternatives, because in a day we do eat different types of food. How to pack enough nutrition in all those occasions so that 
we can meet the daily value requirements of complete protein that we all need. And we do this by making sure we meet the taste, texture, affordability, and a cleaner label decks on all the foods that we make. So with that, I'll stop here. Give it back to Phil. Thank you, Baljit. Can we get uh, Tyler and uh, Mark to join as well? So, uh, pretty cool, eh? Uh, we've got a number of uh, Q and A uh, coming in uh, uh, from the audience. So we'll try to keep up with them uh, <laughs> as we can. Uh, some of them are just uh, uh, complimentary, uh, especially to you, Mark, and to Tyler about the uh, the scaling, the the fact that in a <clears throat> relatively short period of time, when you when you look at how uh, you know, other companies have uh, the time that it's taken to go from nothing to, to something. Uh, uh, several of the audience members wanted to express uh, their compliments to how well you, you did it. But I want to I want to ask a little spin on that. Um, uh, you know, Mark talked about the, the size of the facility there in South Dakota, about a 30,000 ton uh, final product. And and uh, Tyler showed uh the facility both in Wisconsin and, and now in, in Minnesota. Um, everybody knows that the resources that you have at hand will influence the size of the facility that you're able to afford. Uh, how, how did you guys navigate uh, between, you know, what you'd like to have built and what you finally built? And did you land in a spot that has created uh, maybe unique opportunities because of being able to be maybe nimble at the size that you are, or do you go, oh, geez, if I did it again, I I want it to be two or three times as as big. Can you can you guys weigh in on that? And then I also want to ask Baljit about, okay, what's next? What is your infrastructure going to have to look like to to scale? But we'll get to Baljit here in just a second. Mark, you want to you want to lead off there? Well, I, yeah, I'm happy to. I was I was impressed with uh, Tyler's story as well. My my goodness, I I I was in his shoes, you know, kind of staring at the capital investment that we just made and saying, okay, no, you know, no customers, no revenue. Now what? You know, we've got to we've got to go ch chase that down, build build it, and they will come. Um, I, you know, I, I think Tyler said it really well. Uh, you've got to find a capital source that believes in in the story. It's it's like minded in terms of where you're going because. You know, uh, you know, for us, and I think for many entrepreneurs, uh, uh, you know, us being Prairie Aquatech, and I think for many entrepreneurs, you know, it 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 does take you know the the adage of twice as long and cost twice as much. I mean, these these projects are not for the faint of heart, and so you've got to have investors that you know that understand that, that believe in the in the vision and believe in the team. You know, I'd be remiss to say that you know <laughs> we built a perfect plant. I, I don't think that exists. Um, we've learned a ton. Um, the, the scale up that we did from pilot scale was 30 X. So we, we really couldn't take a much bigger step than that from an engineering standpoint. Um, but I, you know, I, my operations team reminds me every day that we didn't build a big enough warehouse. Um, <laughs> and you know, they're just, just, you know, a lot of things like that, you know, value engineering is a real thing. Um, you know, we still office in a construction trailer. Um, you know, we've got a gravel parking lot, you know, they're, they're just, there's some things that you give up in the process to make sure that your process is taken care of and your product is taken care of so that you can deliver to your customers. So I guess that's how I'd answer, Phil. Okay. Okay. So Tyler, how do yeah. you decide where and how big? Well, the, the, the first plant was uh, handed to me. So that was more, yep. not, not, not my decision. I think you look at it though it gave you all optionality. So you can go back and we had the chance to make all the mistakes and say, okay, ooh, if we do that different, how do we do it different? While still keeping the essence of what made the customers want our product, which is tricky because every plan is slightly different. So we were able to look at that and have a full oper operational facility running 24 seven that customers love the stuff and we proved the business model at scale and then could make subtle tweaks at our new facility. I'll tell you a story though, because uh, 
I felt very proud of myself. Uh, a board member tipped me off on the, this plant. I got uh, close with the family that owned it and they called me and, you know, we bought the plan and it's huge spray dryer, wastewater treatment plant, giant boilers, you know, 250,000 uh, square feet. I'm just feeling great. Evaporator, everything that you need. I'm like, this is going to save us so much money. Uh, we were doing the engineering phase four, all of it and, and get the GMP uh, guaranteed max price and have all of our partners figured out. Boom, we're in construction mode. And this is, a, we luckily ordered a bunch of our equipment pre-pandemic. So it was already in route. We took a big risk on that. We, we had the mass balance figured out. And I show up to the plant though, this is during the pandemic and all the floors are tore up. Everything, all the floors are out of like, oh my goodness, what did we do? And it's the little things that you, you're not thinking about location of drains and how everything has to work perfectly together to make healthy and sustainable, but also safe products in highly uh, clean areas. And so those surprises were, uh, you know, not deal killers by any means, but were certainly added to the cost. And, you know, I, I think that if you could build everything you wish to build, you'd certainly build a different plan every time, but you have to do what makes sense and what the capital that you have, but also the, what the return on investment is. And that's one thing about sustainable business models. It's not just sustainable for the world. It has to be sustainable financially as well. And the cost of capital and CapEx is, plays into that immensely. So Belgit, several questions. I'm gonna try to group them together uh, mm -hmm. about the, the fermentation process that you described. So they're, they're wondering, is it uh, wet or dry? Uh, is there a nitrogen source that's important? Uh, you know, obviously if you've got a huge carbon source with, with all this uh, starch and you're doing a, a tremendous flip. <clears throat> and so that's obviously coming uh, from the organism that is, that is facilitating all that. That organism uh, resides in the final product they're, they're asking. And then there's a there's a question about um, regulatory uh, and and sort of freedom to operate when you have uh, uh, or uh, uh, microorganisms contributing that that quality. Where do you guys stand on on that that journey to try to not just describe what has been done to the protein and the amino acid profile, but the safety for for human uh, consumption? And I you you know better than most that it'll be different in every country <laughs> or, <laughs> around so how do you decide you know where in the world are you going to fight those uh you know regulatory battles as your as your process gets uh you know fully uh operational and scaled can you comment that great yeah no great question so um yes of course you know your regulatory um um, concern is uh, is true, um, and as 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 a company, we are focused on United States, North America right now. Um, and uh, talking about microbes, uh, I mean, we are using food microbes that are already used in food fermentations for for centuries. Um, some of the foods we we eat, um, you know, whether it's uh, it's in the area of bread or you know brewing products making fermented uh, you know dairy cultures and dairy foods and and whatnot uh, so these food microbes are considered food safe um, and um, in the end product that biomass the one for the first question was on biomass um, yes that the, the microbial biomass resides uh, as we concentrate uh, over over harvested material after fermentation and that's a proprietary process of how we do this. Uh, so that really contributes to the increase in the protein that we get in the final product. Um, and, uh, you know, there are some um, areas where we are focused on, like, you know, regulatory wise, you know, from a geographical standpoint, uh, there's, a, there's a big shortage of protein in Southeast Asia. Um, as you think, most of the agriculture feedstocks that's grown there um, they are naturally not very high in protein content. Think about rice, cassava, which are the staple foods in that region. And then you look at India, the population in India is, is not only just growing, but they also um, you know, don't have um, ability to even buy meat-based products if somebody likes to convert to eating meat because it's very expensive. 
So they're mostly relying on either dairy or the plant-based, you know, grains, which lacks protein. So we have a huge focus in those economies where definitely we will take the next step on how we meet the regulatory needs there. We are completely focused on non-GM. So we, we, we don't want to create any genetic modification of any of the microbes. So that definitely makes the things easier as we look forward. Okay. Yeah. So Mark, there was a question from the audience about whether you would consider a, a gene edited uh, soybean as a as a raw material in the in the future, and and so why don't you comment about the the challenges that that you've had to face with genetically modified, not genetically modified raw ma raw materials, and how do you how do you do identity preservation uh, with respect to you know customers and territories where you know those kinds of differences would would either have a huge uh, impact on your ability to sell or might actually be a benefit in terms of affordability can you can you comment to that for the audience yeah the the last uh, on identity preservation phil that's a that's a big topic and a lot of admiration for pure uh, for purists and what they've done um, to you know basically control their entire supply chain, you know, from the field uh, and genetics all the way to the food product, because that's, that's critical, um, you know, needing to depend on others for different aspects of that. Um, related to uh, non-genetically modified versus genetically modified, you know, there's two, there's really two things that drive us in terms of that feedstock um, uh, development. You know, one is uh, just the regulatory requirements in Europe in particular. Um, so the Norwegian Atlantic salmon market uh, is a good example of a very large market that requires a non-genetically modified product. And those are just European standards. And so, you know, in order to deliver into that very important market, um, we had to make sure that we had, you know, access to that feedstock and that feedstock worked uh, with our fermentation process. Uh, you know, the, the platform works equally well with uh, uh, gene edited, um, uh, you know, uh, feedstocks. Uh, so gene edited soy. Um, uh, and, and again, it, it's, uh, if, the if the consumer is demanding a certain type of product, we're listening very carefully to the market and trying to deliver the, the, the product that the market is looking for. Um, so the, the platform, the fermentation platform is really agnostic, uh, you know, to the types of, of soybean um, uh, varieties, GMO versus non-GMO that we bring in. Now, you know, what, what, I can, what I can tell you is that we've learned a lot about um, seasonal variation. Uh, we've learned a lot about processing variation, um, and and so you know we're, we've begun to look at the platform and use the platform as a way to make a lot of those variations in feedstock more consistent, so that you can deliver to your customer a more consistent product at the end of the day. Um, but those are those are the things that we look at when we you know look at feedstock development. Okay, okay, and and so. Uh, Tyler, your your uh, breeding efforts are are at least at least now uh, all non non GM, or are you toying with uh, gene editing technology or any any others to bring to to your raw materials? Yeah, it's, it's, a lot of people like to talk about this, and we we definitely have our eyes wide open to all things, and, and kind of building off what Mark said, a similar perspective. You know, our bias in the past, which has really continued on to the future, is uh, you know, what are we trying to do? What problems are we trying to solve? What's the best way to solve those problems quickly? And our natural breeding has been the best because we have a base of genetics work. You know, it's 40 years now nearly, and that that is a lot to build from. So will the technology and gene editing prove out that there's meaningful differences and outcomes that consumers are asking for? One thing I know for sure is consumers that, if they just don't care, that may not be reason enough for us to, you know, jump into that market. We want to create value and we want to create value for farmers as well. And, you know, if there's value to, to be created and, and, it, and it makes a meaningful difference for uh, what we're trying to solve, which is this big protein gap, um, you know, we, we would definitely uh, take the meeting. Okay. Okay. I want to ask all three of you, uh, 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 questions uh, from slightly different angles about freedom to uh, to commercialize. Uh, Tyler, you showed a number of uh, uh, very interesting applications that are that are going to be up against uh, standards of identity. You know, when is an egg an egg? When is milk milk? You know the drill. 
uh, there. And then Baljit, same, same. What, what's going to be the ingredient uh, uh, classification or description, if you will, for these new, uh, you know, protein flowers? Uh, when is it no longer going to be a, a wheat flour or uh, a wheat concentrate or an oat concentrate, you know, depending on, on uh, what's your raw material? Can you uh, comment, Tyler, as to whether or not the uh, the egg board is uh, you know sending you nasty grams uh, <laughs> or or the milk? I know the it's a raging battle and has been for a long time that the dairy folks don't want uh, any of these things to be called milks, and and you guys are waiting right in the middle of that with uh, milk and eggs and and meat alternatives. How do you, how does Purist deal with the standard of identity? And then the same question to you, Belgit, from an ingredient. Uh, perspective. Yeah, a absolutely. And luckily, there's been a well. One, consumers are smart. Uh, that's that's a fortunate thing for the for our industry. And uh, I think the the confusion that likes to be propagated isn't there. Uh, nonetheless, uh, there are some great trade organizations that are doing uh, a plenty of work to try to do this. And however, in some countries and states that have not been successful, uh, so. Back to the consumers want choices. We're not trying to dupe anybody uh, and, and just being very clear in what we're doing. With all that being said, though, there's very strict regulations on getting new food to the market and having FDA grass, uh, you know, generally recognized as safe. Our, our pea protein went through that process. We had to be pioneers in that. Others in our industry did as well. You know, you even look at the increased use of pea starch as a core starch product, and especially at this very moment in time where starch isn't available like it typically is. Yeah. Yep. So, Baljit, to you, is this, are, are you going to be selling uh, flowers, concentrates, isolates, all the above? Uh, I'm, I'm curious whether or not you've had any interaction with uh, the big industrial uh, bakers and what they would say about, well, what the heck is this thing I'm buying from uh, Tele Farms because it's got to go on an ingredient deck at, at some point and what, what am I going to be able to call it or not call it? Yeah, no, absolutely, uh, Phil. And, and I think the, the key thing here is, I think Tyler touched on it. And I mean, consumer is very smart and, and this is how we are we are looking at it. You know, at the end of the day, um, the technology I'm hearing, Mark, uh, you know, fermenting soybeans, it's really fermented soybean meal. Yes, the proteins and other things are as a result of it. And so, so these are really fermented flowers, if you will. And really, it's grain agnostic. You can use any grain. Um, um, and consumer smart uh, regulatory bodies may require us to put the name of the organism that you, you, you have used. This is how I've seen other companies doing it. Um, so you may have to write down the name of the organism and then it's fermented proteins, fermented, fermented wheat flowers or fermented other grain flowers. Um, and this is how we will be approaching it for now. But I think, as you said, Phil, I mean, going forward, I think hopefully the regulatory um, approvals will help bringing more transparency to this. Really, it's a, when, 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 when we are fermenting a, a grain-based product or sugars, sometimes you're using a consortium of these different microbes. You're not gonna put all those microbes on the ingredient label, but the end result is really a fermented product. If you look at how sourdough is made today, there is like, I would say hundreds of microbes in that. Now, if somebody starts making those microbes, how are we gonna put all the ingredient, uh, all the microorganism names and the strains and the species on one ingredient deck. But I think there's got to be more work done also so that we can show that these are food safe as well. Yep. Yeah, it, it's very clear there's gonna have to be, uh, uh, quite frankly, some innovation in the way the regulatory bodies uh, deal with this. So Mark, you wanna, you're dealing with the same thing with uh, respect to, uh, uh, to feed ingredients. Obviously you've got, uh, you know, AFCO as a long-standing regulatory framework, uh, but but describe uh, the kind of the similar standard of identity efforts uh, underway at, at Prairie Aquatech, and and then also overlay 
uh, the global territories because your map of where their commercial activities are is is all over the globe. Mm -hmm. And as we know, the rules and the opinions and the the framework for saying yes or no, you're you're ready to sell into our country is is non trivial. So can you describe that too from a uh, technology platform standpoint? Yeah, I'll maybe I'll maybe start there, Phil, from an international perspective that. Um, Every every country has been different, um, and we have a person on our team, as you know, that's really been learning country by country as we've gotten registered, the product registered in each of these countries. And in some cases, you know, you might be called, uh, as Belgit said, um, you know, a fermented uh, soy product. Uh, in other countries, you may simply be called a feed material. And so, I, you know, I think what our team has done successfully, and this is, you know, maybe some advice for other entrepreneurs getting into this. Uh, global registration space for their product is, you know, you develop a base package of information that, you know, certificate of free sale and, and uh, block flow diagram that doesn't, you know, give away too much proprietary information, but helps the government agency understand exactly what you're doing and the inputs that go into your product. Um, you know, developing that base package of information has been critical. And then you just be prepared to adapt that into every country that, that you move into. Now, you know, here in the, in the U.S., I, I really have to compliment, um, you know, AFIA and other trade organizations uh, that have really been lobbying for more support, more uh, federal government support to move applications through faster. Uh, because as Belgit and, and Tyler have, you know, have kind of pointed out, you know, the, the food industry is moving, the food innovation industry is moving very quickly. And, and these products are, are you know, the, the same but different. Um, and, and so we need a federal government that responds quickly to, you know, what the, the type of innovation that we're putting in front of them. And so, you know, there has been more resources that have gone into FDA uh, and FDA CVM um, and the AFCO organization to try to move these applications along. So, you know, I really, you know, compliment the trade organizations and the federal government for that they're putting into this and being adaptive to, you know, kind of working with entrepreneurs to work through some of these, you know, challenging issues. And you can just imagine with this uh, executive order coming out of the White House to facilitate uh, technology, you know, development of all types and to facilitate uh, the development of talent that could, that could be used for the industry. We just can never forget at the end of it is there's this door and the door's closed until you have the the rights to to walk through it and and so i hope that they're thinking about you know the entirety of the of the supply chain because there's uh there's all kinds of innovation across that entirety of that supply chain that will that will need to kind of come all together in order to to meet these needs in the kind of time time frame that that we have to Okay, I, I know we're getting we're getting close to the end here, so I, I wanted to to finish with uh, uh, you know kind of a, a question for you guys as uh, as CEOs. Uh, two of you operate in sort of similar territories in the Northern Plains, and then now Belgit, you're out in the uh, hot cauldron of uh, biotech in uh, in California. <laughs> How do you find uh, the talent that that needs to be in your organization to to do all the special things that all of you guys have have described? What's what's hard? What's easy? You know how how could the industry more more uh, effectively support the development of young uh, talent or the providing the kinds of incentives uh, that entrepreneurs would need to get the kind of talent needed to make these things happen uh, and happen in a timely fashion. Um, Baljit, you want to start for us uh, since you're, you got your feet in the, in the uh, deep end of the hot pool in, in uh, California. <laughs> how do you, how yeah. do you, com how do you compete against, uh, you know, every and perfect day and all, all of these other interesting uh, companies who are trying to do, you know, similar but different things. So. Yeah, absolutely, Phil. And that's a great question because definitely there are some uh, pros and cons uh, of uh, of having a startup company in all these different regions across the United States. You know, I have uh, I have in my past life I've been in Midwest where I've seen you know there are a lot of co-manufacturing facilities there that naturally makes sense to you know partner with. Um, 
I've also worked with startups that are in Midwest. They are doing fine. But then now I'm in a startup here in the Bay Area. So what we are learning is really, I mean, the, uh, the availability of talent is just incredible here in the Bay Area. Yes, but it does bring more competition to all those, uh, you know, some companies you mentioned, Phil, but there are over 1,000 startups here in various different stages. Yeah. But at the same time, the recruiting activity is also very good. You know, a lot of talent are willing to, uh, fresh talents in the mid-career level, they're willing to relocate to work on you know, all these disruptive innovation companies. So we are actually not having any trouble hiring for all the research needs that the company needs. Uh, so that's a very good spot to be in. Uh, yeah. However, as we look at partnerships, where are we going to be growing our manufacturing um, base or doing other things that that's lacking in California, definitely. So that's how we're looking at other parts of the United States where we can partner with. Okay. Tyler, you want to go next? Yeah, there's certainly a, a difference between the research and technical talent than and engineering and, and things of that nature than frontline staff. And I think the our sites, we've had to get really clear on what it looks like to be a part of this team and, and those subcultures. You know, something I'm pretty proud of that how serious uh, leaders within Puris have taken uh, engaging with the local community and, and building something that is different. I mean, we have a pea protein plant in the, in the cheese head state. I mean, they couldn't be more dairy uh, cheese plants than there are uh, around us. And it, it's just a, a bit of a change, but, but they've done a, a heck of a job of building a culture. You know, with that being said, it, it's been challenging, you know, from how do you produce profitably uh, with you know, global co competition that doesn't have the same labor laws and practices that the United States certainly does. And, and with that being said, as we're big, but not huge, and the growth paradox is real. Every time you get a little bit bigger, the complexity of decision-making and how you could scale communication, all of that. So to me, the key thing is, yes, recruiting is important, but developing your people internally so they can take the next jobs. It keeps uh, leveling up. Our bias at Purist is we put people uh, in, in, in stretch roles that maybe they haven't done it before. I've never been a CEO, and I'm doing it now, and we we can win based on that so we're certainly product led but we're people driven and uh it's um it's pretty yeah it's a pretty cool part of part of the company for sure lean and mean yeah yep yeah. so not just recruiting but uh retaining them once you have them in the door right how do you how do you uh, you know continue to make it exciting every day so that when they get behind the wheel of the car and drive into work they're they're dying to to get there and and uh within reason they don't want to leave at the, <laughs> at the right. end of the day Mark, uh, how, how about you? I can't see it any better than Tyler just did. I mean, I, homegrown is, is, is best and in, in developing from within and giving people experiences and opportunities. Um, you know, we, you know, I think we have a benefit of being a, um, a, a university uh, based technology. And so, you know, a lot of our research talent is coming out of uh, my co-founders uh, and their labs from the university. And so that's certainly a, you know, a, a draw for research talent. Uh, we had the benefit of a pilot plant uh, that, you know, we had, you know, recruited a number of operators into our pilot plant. And then when we constructed the commercial plant, they all moved from the pilot plant to the commercial plant. So they experienced the same scale up that, that we all did, um, but, but they understood the process and how the process worked. And so that was, that was a big benefit to us. And then you reach a, as you grow, um, you reach a tipping point where, you know, your, the vision that you have and the success that you, that you have as you scale your technology, uh, that tipping point attracts, begins to attract people from outside of the geography, you know, to your story. And that, and that's been, that's been helpful to us as well. Yeah. Well, I don't want you guys to go away with, uh, uh, your head swollen from, um, from your egos, but I've got two uh, messages from the audience that, um, uh, uh, this was the best uh, forum that they've ever seen in the uh, plant pro protein forum three years. So, so good job. Um, there's plenty of other uh, questions. Uh, 
Uh, there are, some were very detailed. Uh, Mark, lots of questions about uh, phytic acid and oligosaccharides and all and all that. Each one of you has uh, a number of those, and so uh, your contact details will be available uh, to audience members. And I encourage everybody to to reach out, uh, and we'll we'll try to shuttle uh, folks. Uh, uh, to you uh, that have uh, questions. Uh, there are a number of things also beyond this about uh, upcycling of co-product streams and personal care and all kinds of things like this that are very, very, very relevant. But we're we're about out of time, and we'll just have to we'll have to find time in the future as uh, progress is made in in a lot of those areas. So we all Phil, thank I, you for what you've done. Yeah, if I could, if I could, Phil, congratulate my co-presenters because I, you know Tyler used the word exhausting. This is not for the faint of heart, and I, I just admire and respect what Tyler and, and Belgit have done. So, congratulations to them. Thank you. Great to be here, Phil and yep. Tyler and Mark. Thank you. Yeah, yeah share the same sorry. set of it. Thank you, guys. Yep. As I always say, if it were easy, somebody would have done it a long time ago, right? <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, power on, guys. We appreciate it, and. Uh, Next uh, Monday, there will be a technical session that will be leading up to the forum. It uh, focuses on fermentation technology. So I encourage uh, those in the audience who have interest in that space to join. It's Monday morning. And then the forum itself uh, kicks off in, in uh, Chicago the first week of October. And uh, I'm telling you, I am very, very uh, thankful for all the work of uh, the members of the organizing committee who've helped me put together a, a lineup that has got, I mean, world-class uh, talent in a number of areas uh, from supply chain and structure function and uh, interactions in food and all sorts of topics that are incredibly relevant to the industry. So if you, if you can't be there in Chicago, try to find time or, or Try to get members of your organization to attend uh, virtually because you can get a lot of the benefit even with virtual uh, attendance. And we'd appreciate uh, you know any help you guys can make there. There's there's great grand opportunities for especially people early to mid career to to learn and and create opportunities to expand their their networks. So anything you can do there, uh, we would certainly appreciate it. All right. All right, so with that, Amy, we're going to turn it over to uh, uh, back to AOCS, and we appreciate all the help uh, behind the scenes making this, I think, fairly uh, fairly seamless. We didn't have any screens go dark or anything like that, and uh, it was only through uh, your guys' help that, that again, you've, you've done a stellar job in facilitating what was, a, I think, a really good webinar, so we appreciate the help. Thanks everyone for a wonderful session and thanks for everyone that tuned in and uh, participated in the conversation. Have a Very good day. Good. Very good. Thank you.